Hey, we're going to begin, uh, we're going to continue in our series uh, today regarding our words. And let me open up my document, please. Praise the Lord. There it is. Today's message is entitled, Watch Your Words. Everybody say, watch your words. The words are invisible. How can you watch them? But we're, we really should watch what we say. When I was young, my mom used to say to me, if you can't say anything nice, what? If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I don't think I still got the complete understanding of that, and I know she didn't have it either. But she worked on it all of her life. Say amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, one of my first memories with the Word of God, one of my first memories with the Bible is this. I had, I had heard um, my father say a word that it was not a very good word, and um, it, it was sharp, it was harsh, and, and I liked the impact that it had on my mom, if you know what I mean. It, it, it startled her. And so at first grade, this girl had kind of made me mad, and I don't even think I spelled the word right. But I used that word in a little note to her. And I gave it to her in first grade. And unfortunately, the teacher sent an envelope home with me that day. And inside of that envelope was that note with that word on it. I had written and said something very harsh. And you know what my punishment was? It wasn't the spanking that I usually got. My punishment was that I had to go into a bedroom and read James chapter 3 ten times when I was a first grader. James chapter 3 talks about the power of our words. James chapter 3 talks about uh, how we need to watch our words. Talks about the, the, our words are the rudder of our life. Our words actually become the thing that steer the ship of our life. Our, our words are what causes our faith to become alive and activates our faith. Our words are what we're going to be judged by. And, and at first grade, you know, God's trying to get this in me. And to be honest with you, he's still trying to get it in me. How many of you have said something in the past that you wish you hadn't said? Come on. Now, how, now check this out. How many of you have wished you had said something that you didn't say? Can I see it? Exactly. Because something on the inside of every man, woman, or child, whether you're born again or not, we know the power of our words. So we need to watch our words. We're going to continue from last week's series. And if you didn't, if you didn't get, weren't here last week, you can watch it on YouTube or Facebook. Go to the, cathedral, or the High Point Church page or go to Kenny L. And you can watch that message. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, make a tree good, and the fruit will be good. Make a tree bad, and the fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Okay, that's an apple, so that's not an orange tree. Got it? That's a tangerine, so it's not a pear tree. You recognize a a tree by its fruit. Now, I want you to know something, guys, that that maybe this scripture doesn't particularly say. It doesn't mean that every piece of fruit that comes off the tree is good. Even the best Christian is going to have a piece of fruit come off their tree that is going to have worms in it. Or maybe is stunted or doesn't fully mature and and doesn't have a, a lot of meat or apple or meat on it. So so don't say, just because somebody casts off one or two bad words or does one or two bad things, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the class of fruit, the kind of fruit. You got that? For Jesus goes on, he says, this is what the fruit is. It's what you say out of your mouth. For your mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If If you're full of the things of God, then you are going to be a God tree, producing God fruit. If, if, if your, your heart is full of things of the world or selfish things or, 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 or self-promoting things, then, then you're going to be a satanic or a humanistic tree producing satanic or humanistic fruit. So Jesus says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. How can you, how can you make a tree good? Well, you've got to put something in your heart. 
Because a good man brings up good things that he has stored up in himself, and an evil man brings up things that he's stored up within himself. You know as well as I do that you can't control what you say if your heart is full of something else. In the, in the heat of the moment, when the pressure's on, baby, when you get squeezed, that's when who you are comes out. And it comes out your mouth. And you want to know what's inside of a man? Squeeze him. You want to know what's inside of a woman? Put some pressure on her. Come on, trials, tribulation, sickness, disease, whatever it is. You put financial pressure. You put that on, you're going to find out what's in them. You know, people, people expose themselves when they're under pressure. And they usually don't expose themselves by their actions first. It is most of the time by their words. For by your words, Jesus said, listen very carefully, you're going to be acquitted. Or by your words, you'll be condemned. The paragraph above that, Jesus says, I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every idle or empty word they have spoken. Why? Because your words reveal what's in your heart. And some people have bought the lie that you're going to be judged by your heart. You're not. You're going to be judged by what you say. And you're going to be judged by what you do. Because everybody knows God has done a tremendous work in our hearts, right? We're a much better person in our spirit and in our heart than we tend to play it out. Am I right? So our faith is expressed by what we say. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, the Bible says this, that nothing counts in the kingdom of God except for the things that you express, the things that you say in love. Nothing counts in eternity except for the things that you say that are driven by the love of the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus says, for by your words, not your heart, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Now, I've got good news, and I've got bad news. I've got happy news, and I've got some sorrowful news. And, and, and it, it, it depends on, on, on where you're at in life. Because none of us are perfect. The Bible says no man can tame the tongue completely because if you could, you'd be perfect. You'd be able to do anything if you could tame your tongue. Do you see the power of the tongue? In James it says if you could, tell, if you could keep your tongue from saying the wrong things and keep your tongue saying the right things, you'd be perfect. You can't tame the tongue. Everybody say, I can't tame the tongue. You, you, you know it. You, you hit your thumb with a hammer. Can you, can you tame it then? Maybe what's in it is going to come out. You don't want to be around pastor if I hit my thumb with a hammer because I might slip. So I might say something that make you know, think I'm of the devil or something, but I'm not. It's just I've hit my thumb on the hammer in a construction site many times when I wasn't living for the Lord, and so it still comes out of my mouth. And I, I'm quick to reverse it. I'm quick to say I'm sorry. I'm quick to repent. But when, 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 when something, something like that happens... But I, I know my heart's good. I can't tame this. If I want to, if I want to make this the fruit be good, what has to happen in here? I have to store up good things in my heart. I've got to store the promises of God, the word of God, the faith of God, the love of God. I've got to begin to think about those kind of things, deposit them in my heart. So when the pressure comes, what comes out of my mouth isn't doubt, isn't a curse, come on, isn't cursing, isn't hatred, isn't judgmental. I've got to store up good things in my mouth, in my heart, so that what comes out of my mouth, because it's going to be a fruit, not a discipline. Please hear me. You cannot make yourself say the right things if you have the wrong things in your heart. Because from the things that are in your heart, your mouth is going to speak. It's the overflow. Proverbs 12, 18 says, some people make cutting remarks, by the word, by, by, but the words of the wise bring healing. The words that you speak 
to yourself, over yourself, and to other people are either going to cut them down or it's going to build them up. And don't tell me that God has just given you a a prophetic spirit and all you do is criticize. No, 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 that's not a prophetic spirit. That is the spirit of criticism. It is a spirit of pride that says you know more than they know and therefore they're not enough and you're judging them. But I'm helping them. No, you're not. You're tearing them down. You can bring correction in love, but if it has a slice to it, if it has a cut to it. I was in a relationship years ago, and this person, you know, I I love this person. And this person could say things. I know I'm talking to a few of you right now. And they could say things. And it was like, ouch, that really hurt. But once the knife was in the back, it had another twist to it. Do you know what I mean? It it was almost demonic. It it would actually twist. And that was that cutting and that destruction. Why? Because I loved that person so the words had more value. And what they used those words for when they were angry were destructive. To tear me down. It made them feel better. It made me think of myself as less. And it caused what's in my heart to be damaged. And I'm still working, guys, on on filling my heart with good things about myself because so many things that have negative have been said over me in my childhood and in my young adulthood. So when you hear the word, when you hear the word, store that up in your heart. When you hear words that don't line up with God's promises about you, your identity in Christ, you've got to say, I'm not going to let that get deposited in my heart because you can't, you can't tame this, but you can guard your heart. And you can fill your heart with the things that you want out of the kingdom of God so that when the pressure comes, the good things come out of your mouth and they activate the power of God. Words are powerful. Proverbs 18, 21 says this about your words. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Your words are either going to destroy, hurt people, and tear down the kingdom of God, or your words are going to encourage, build up, and give compassion, and build up that other person or people. Can I get an amen? Amen. But many of us were raised in a destructive atmosphere, and that's all we know. There's a person that's close to our family, and and I swear, her words, her words, her language of love is criticism with a oomph to it because the oomph is how she gets it to stick. My father used words like that. My mother used words like that. But they did it with anger because when they did it with anger, mm. when they did it with force, mm. when they did it with intensity, mm. it made a bigger impact. The problem was those words were not of God. Those words may have expressed a truth, but they took it into their flesh to, mm, to make it mean more so to stick. And I've had to learn in disciplining my kids that I don't have to use anger to get them to remember the truth like I was taught. Because my words over my children, my words over my wife, my words over this church, my words over your life are either going to be, bring life or they're going to bring death. Either they're going to bring what God wants in your life, in their life, or they're going to bring what Satan wants in their life. And Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. James chapter 3 says, and so blessing and cursing come out of our mouths. Guys, it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't speak blessing over our children one minute and cursing the next. We shouldn't shouldn't speak blessing over our families, our ministries, our business, our partners in business. Come on. Our employees, we speak life at one time, and then we speak a cursing the next, and we wonder why we don't have a stable relationship with them. We don't wonder why our business relationships aren't lasting. We wonder why, why, why people don't, don't want to go to lunch with us. We want, come on, because we're, we're life and death are coming out of our tongue, and we're, we're not guarding it. Mm. Are you guys okay? 
Y'all look like I'm chewing you out, and I'm, I'm not. I'm really, I'm just, we all have this problem, okay? Every one of us have this problem. Some of us have it really bad, and some of us have it bad. How about that? Okay, praise the Lord. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the heart, this is, this is it. Come on, put a buffer in between what you say and what you think. If you say everything you think, your, your life is going to hell, and so is everybody around you. You're going to have sick people around you all your life. Your family's going to be sick all your life. You're going to be broken. I'm not, I'm not saying all sickness and disease is because of a problem we have on our side, but I'm telling you what, you can speak sickness into a person's life. You can speak death into a person's life. Or you can speak life. The, the heart of the godly thinks before speaking. If you say whatever comes to your mind, you could be speaking God's will or you could be speaking the devil's will. You could be speaking life over yourself and, and your family or you could be speaking death over yourself and your family. And you don't even know the power of your words. They are so powerful. That's how you got saved. That's how you release God, God's will into your life, through your words. Proverbs 17, 27 says, the one who has knowledge uses words with, l- l- what's that word? restraint and whoever has understanding is even tempered let me give you a shortcut don't speak when you're angry don't speak when you're angry nine times out of ten when you're angry and you're speaking you're going to be speaking words from the pit of hell over your life over your friends over your family over your business, over your associates, over your city? Come on. In fact, one of the biggest rebukes God ever gave me was this. I used to do evangelistic work, Needs and I did, and we did large events. I mean, we would see anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000 people born again every week that we did these events. We trained thousands of pastors, helped churches, even plant some churches and dig wells while we were doing these things. And it, it was tremendous. But I come back to the United States. And I'd come to a church like this, and I would get so mad at the church because it seemed like the church was living for themselves, and there's all these people overseas who'd never even heard the gospel, and they're hurting, and they've got nothing. And it seemed like we were so selfish. And, and, and so I would criticize the church. And, and God spoke to me. He says, stop tearing down with your tongue what I'm trying to build because Jesus is the builder of the church. And all I had to say about the church was negative. And that was one of the sharpest corrections I've ever had from God. He says, stop tearing down with your tongue what I'm trying to build. And I realized I could dismantle the very works that God wants to do in my life and Jesus is doing on the earth by the things that I say about his church and his people. And, and it has made a huge impact. on You won't get me to say something negative about another man's church. You won't get me to talk negative about a, a pastor, a minister, even if they're wrong, because the Bible says, who am I? Jesus said, who are you to judge another man's servant? Yes. That pastor's not my servant. He's Jesus' servant. Amen. Uh-huh. I'll let God deal with it. Yes. Can, can I get an amen? amen? Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues, the Bible says. Even fools, people think, wow, that person's wise. That, that, person's, that person is very discerning. No, they just didn't open up their mouth and let the foolishness gush out. I, I, I remember, I remember, uh, I remember when I used to club. And don't, don't look at me that way because half of you, three quarters of you club. And some of you are still clubbing. And you shouldn't be, but you are. I'm like, woo, that girl's hot. She's good looking. Wow. And then she opened her mouth. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're, you have an impression about somebody until they start talking. Because when you talk, you reveal who you are. Not only that, you're being judged by not only the world, but by Jesus by what you say. So Proverbs 21 says, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. I wish I would have learned that about 
50 years ago. I wish I would have learned that last year. Watch your, watch what you say. Come on, keep your mouth shut if you can't say anything nice. And you're going to stay out of trouble. You'll stay in the kingdom of God. You'll stay in the blessing. You'll stay in the favor. You'll stay in the love of God. And, and you find, well, if you open your mouth and stuff comes out that is not beneficial or helpful to other people, but it's always corrective, shut your mouth. I'm sorry. I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you. That's why I'm getting excited. Because this is the biggest issue I've ever had. And if you've been in sales or sales marketing or management or business ownership, then God has given you the ability to communicate. It's one of your gifts. And guess where the biggest attack in your life is going to come? Through that gift to communicate. So put a restraint on your mouth. Put a bit on your tongue. Put a buffer between your brain and what you say. Give God time to analyze, help you analyze what you're going to say. I saw something this week on TikTok. It was one of the best things I've seen in a long time. This guy who's just astounding in his wisdom, uh, somebody who's not born again, says, do you ever wrestle with God? And the guy said, I wrestle with God every day. And this guy, Joe Rogan, says, what do you mean you wrestle with God? every day. He said, every word I say, I wrestle with God whether I should say it or not. And everything that I say, because I put a buffer between my my thoughts and what I say, I wrestle with myself, and I wrestle with the word, and I wrestle with the spirit of God of whether or not I should say it. And I went, wow, that's so good, I'm going to put it up on the screen during service. I wrestle with God. Proverbs 29, 20 says, there's no more hope for a fool than someone who speaks without thinking. Hold on, but I'm thinking it. No, no, that's not what he's talking about. Consider what you're going to say. Consider the effect of what you're going to say. Consider how it's going to, how it's going to impact somebody else's life. Is it going to build them up or is it going to tear them down? Is it your job to correct them or is it the Holy Spirit's job to correct them? Now, I'll bet you're saying, well, Pastor, you should listen to what you're saying because you're correcting me. No, I'm preaching, I'm preaching Bible, okay? I'm trying to help us understand. I am supposed to bring correction and rebuke and encouragement and comfort. Yes. Amen. That's in my job assignment. But I use the word to do it. Yes. I'm not doing this. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can do that if it's necessary, but I don't think it is. James 1.26, this is very important. If you claim to be religious, but you don't control your tongue... You're only fooling yourself, and your faith in Christ isn't going to produce much. That's what it says. Your religion is worthless. If you don't, come on, put a bit in your tongue. If you don't, put a buffer between your brain and your mouth. Come on. If if, if you don't consider how these words are going to affect you because it's steering your life, if you don't consider these words are paving the road that you're going to be walking on in the next week, if you don't understand those things, then your religion, your faith in Jesus Christ has been of no value. It still exists. You're probably going to heaven, okay? But you're not getting there on the kingdom's route. It's hard. It's frustrating. I feel beat up all the time. I feel, I just am not, I'm not doing well. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand something must be wrong. Yes, something is wrong. And it's between your ears and your chin and your nose. Come on. Say we love you, Pastor. Pastor. Say it again because I'm starting to doubt it. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. I don't want your faith to be of no value to you. God wants your faith to work. God wants your faith to produce. God God wants what you believe to actually come to pass in your life. But, But we release the prayer of faith and then we disconnect from God or we short circuit the power of God by the things that we're saying to other people, about other people, and about them. And even about him. 1 Peter 3.10 says, if you want to enjoy life, 
and you want to see many, many, come on, long life, many happy days, keep your tongue, keep your, shut your mouth, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Here's a lie. Jesus said, by, the word of God says, by his stripes you're healed. And he said, I'm not healed. I'm not healed. It's not working for me. That's why, because you're lying. Facts aren't equivalent to the truth of God's word. That's what Abraham was considered righteous for because God said he was going to have a kid and Abraham said, I don't know how you're going to do this because I'm old, she's old, but you said it and I know you'll do it. I don't know how, but I know you're going to do it. So I'm choosing the, 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 the fact, I'm choosing, I'm choosing the reality of the truth of your word over the circumstances and situations that I'm experiencing. Can I get an amen? amen. Matthew chapter 15. It's not what goes in your mouth. He's talking about washing your hands before you eat. Not because of hygiene, but because back in the day, if you were a Jew, you had to ceremonially wash your hands before you'd eat anything. And his disciples went ahead and just started eating without washing their hands. And the Pharisees got all mad like they're going to hell over that. And Jesus says, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. So if what's in here isn't right yet, if what's in here isn't lined up with God's word about your life and other people and the body of Christ and the church, if it's not right in here, guys, then what should you do? It starts with an S and ends with up. Come on, what should you do? What should you do? Until you get this right. Or learn to say things like, he sure has pretty teeth. There was this old boy in a small town, and in this small town, there, this old boy was, he was, he was, he said, ornery. He was mean. Nobody liked him. He was shrewd. He was rude. He put people, he put people out and off all the time. And seriously, not even his own family would talk to him. Well, the old boy died. Everybody came to his funeral because he was affluent. They came to his funeral, and they're walking by. And, 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 and there was this other old boy who was raised with this other guy, but this other guy who's still alive never said anything bad about anybody. Have you ever met anybody like that? I've met people like that before I understood this truth, and I thought something was wrong with them. I thought, I, I thought Nija was the most naive person in the world when I met her. And I found out she wouldn't say anything wrong about any, anybody. She, she, she would restrain her words. She, she would shut her mouth. My dad would say things that were so crude and rude, and he'd go, la, 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 you know, and just act like it didn't happen. And I, I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Did, didn't you hear what he said? It's God. Da, 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 da. She was biting her tongue. She's being wise. And that's what this other old boy was like. And so everybody was watching the guy who never said anything bad about somebody. And they were seeing, seeing him go by the casket. Everybody's going by the casket, and they would say something, you know. And, and they were wondering what this old boy would say because he never said anything wrong or bad about anybody. He never was critical. So everybody was listening. And the guy who never said mean things or bad things or came up, and he looked at him for a while. And everybody kind of leans in. And he looked at him more, and he leaned in. Finally, he says, well, he did have pretty teeth. And he walked away. you got to find something good. Find something good. Well, they sure had a good family. Well, they, 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 sure, attended, they sure loved the Word of God. Find something. They sure were generous. Find something good positive verse 18 but the words you speak come from your heart and that's what defiles you so ephesians 4 29 says you know if i don't want to be defiled come on i want my life to be holy i want my life i want to walk in god's best don't you well i gotta watch what i say again if you're a communicator by gift this is going to be difficult for you because you've got to put a buffer between what you say 
and what you think. And don't tell me that you can't, because if you're in sales, you are always judging, is this the right thing to say to cause this transaction to happen? Can I lead this person in this decision? And you're, you're putting everything against that filter. You'll do it for money, now do it for God. Good. Are you hearing me? Yeah. You'll do it to get promoted, now do it for God. Men, you'll do it for your wife so there's no strife in the home. Don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about. Do it for God. Right. Women, you, you, you do it for your the relationship and your household. Do it for God. We all can do it. Your motivation has to be there. The power of life and death is in your tongue. Can I get an amen? amen. It's the way it is. It's not going to change. So I better get used to it. Proverbs 16, 24 says this. Gracious words are a honeycomb. I want you to hear this. Words that are full of God's grace are sweet to the soul and they bring healing to the bones. You know what he's saying? When you speak words of grace in a tough situation, you bring peace to that other person's mind and their spirit and that releases healing in their bones. Don't miss this. The bone is full of marrow. The marrow produces blood. And the Bible says the soul life of a creature is in the blood. Are you hearing me? Yeah. In other words, the healthiness of your entire body comes through your blood. And if you'll speak words that are full of God's grace, it's going to bring peace to the soul. And it's going to bring healing to the bones, which is healing to the blood. Ephesians 4.29 says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. So what am I supposed to speak? Oh, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen, not you. I want to remind you, please, please look up at me. Please, please, please get this. Christians, we're not called to be anybody's Holy Spirit. We can use the word, right? We're not called to be anybody else's Holy Spirit. I never will understand why people tell people out in the world who aren't even born again, you need to quit cussing, you need to quit smoking, you need to quit hanging around with people that will do all those things in the bars. Well, how can they? They're captive to sin. They need to come to Jesus and let the transformation begin in their heart. That's where the change will come from. And yes, you can encourage. Yes, you, you can rebuke if you're in a, a, a position of leadership. But you know, you, know, you know from being here, the rebuke doesn't come very often. Because I'm not your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may speak through me, through the words I'm saying. He'll put something in there for you. He'll do that work. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, so they'll benefit. Proverbs 16, 24 says, gracious words are a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul, but healing to the bones. Proverbs 18, 21, remember this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Say, my tongue. Watch your tongue. Watch your words. They're powerful. Now, I hope today that you understand this is not a doctrine. This is Bible. I gave you scriptures out of the Old Testament. I gave you scriptures out of the New Testament. I gave you scriptures out of the Gospels. I gave you scriptures out of the Epistles. This is our faith. You're saved by your words. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you openly declare, if you say that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart. In other words, what's in my heart is what's coming out of my mouth. That God raised Jesus from the dead, then you'll be saved. Because it's by believing in your heart you're made right with God, but you aren't saved yet. You have to declare your faith and then you're saved. 
That's how you enter into salvation. By believing and saying what the Word of God tells us. What the Word of God reveals to us. And that's how every single piece of faith is energized by God's presence and power. Is by believing in your heart and speaking it out of your mouth. See, Hebrews 11, 3 says, it's by faith we understand that everything was formed by the power of God's word. You were recreated in Christ Jesus as speaking spirit. You were created to form things by your words. What you say will have everything to do with the road that's paved ahead of you. That's why so many of you are reading the book right now, The Believer's Authority, so you can begin to understand that you have so much power in your tongue. You can't control it. So fill your heart with the promises of God. Fill your heart with the Word of God. Fill your heart with the intention of God for your life and begin to speak it out of your mouth. Only things that are beneficial and help others grow and build them up. Can I get an amen? Because Jesus said about your words in 11, 20, Mark eleven twenty two, 22. Truly I tell Jesus said this. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, they're saying what they believe. If they don't, if they don't doubt in their heart, what they say will happen for them and it will be done. But please hear me. You can't take the shortcut of saying without the biblical belief in your heart. What's in your heart many times will fight with what's in your head. Circumstances and situations, the way I feel, all that's emotions, all memory, all that's in my head. And the only way that I am going to override, overrule, and begin to think of the things of the kingdom of God is to put God's word in my heart. Once it's in my heart, it can help renew my head. But i got to get it in my heart for my faith to work. Because if I just say it and I don't believe it, there's nothing that's going to happen. Because the Bible says that the demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They're not going to heaven. They shudder and fear and they quake because they know they're already destined for hell. So the belief is there, but the confession is not. Colossians 3.16 says, let your heart be filled with God's word. Deuteronomy eleven eighteen says, Therefore shall ye lay up my words in your heart. I'm going to put God's words in my heart. Another scripture, Proverbs 13, 3. The one who guards his heart preserves his life. The one who opens his mouth wide, diarrhea of the mouth, his life's going to come to ruin. Another scripture says, where the words are many, sin is not far. Sin is not absent. We're judged here, guys. Honestly, the, what you're getting in your life, most of it is the result of what you've said over the last couple of years. So choose to speak words of life. James chapter 1. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this, please. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Why are those two together? Because if you're quick to speak, you're going to be quick to get angry. If you put a buffer between your, what you're thinking and what you're saying, you're going to have a buffer between your emotions of anger and being angry. Have you ever noticed people who get angry very quickly talk a lot and quickly? So in my life, that's been an issue in the past because I was always a talker until I found out why I was talking. I really believe that God gave us words to create, not communicate. I think communication is a second purpose of our words. We create our future with our words. So be quick to listen and slow to what? How many ears do you have? How many mouths do you have? So let's use them in proportion to that. Let's listen twice as much as we speak. 
If, you're the, if you come into a room and, and you're the one doing all the talking, sweet pea, you better find out if somebody's listening first. Because if you're the one doing all the talking, I guarantee not everybody's listening. Because you can watch them shut, they shut down, you know. We had this old boy that kind of helped run um, ministry, helps for a ministry for a while. And he was, he was, he said, he'd go into a meeting and he'd just talk, 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 talk. And he told me later, I was told that the person who talks the most is the, is the strongest leader in the room. And I thought, no, the person who talks the most is the most foolish person in the world and in the room. I'm learning to listen. Can you? I'm learning to speak after thinking. Can you? See, Jesus said, I have come so that you might have life and have it abundantly. It's going to be struggles, it's going to be trials, but Jesus came so that you could experience everything that he came to give us. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, today I've given you the choice. I'm talking about words. Between life and death. Between blessings and cursings. You're going to speak life or you're going to speak death. What's sad is so many Christians will speak life over themselves but death over everybody else. And they don't understand why they struggle. Speak life. Speak hope. Speak mercy. Speak grace. Because today you're going to choose. I pray that you start choosing every word. Am I going to choose life or am I going to choose death? Am I going to choose blessing or am I going to choose cursing? Oh, that you choose life. Oh, that you choose words of life so that you may live and your kids may live. Would you bow your head with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Help us to guard our lips. Help us to put a buffer between our, our brain and our mouth. Help us to pause when we feel the emotions rising up and we feel like we, we just have to say something. Help us to pause and to filter what we're going to say through your word, through your spirit, and through compassion. Help us to choose words of life. Help us to choose the blessing by what we say. And give us a desire for your word and your promises and your presence. So that God, as we seek after you, our heart gets full of life. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you've been speaking words of death over your life. Or you've rejected Jesus. You've run away from him. Or maybe you need to know him today or know him better. Then I want to pray with you. This is a decision between you and God. And if you want to, if you want to talk to him today and you want to put the blessing of the Lord on your life because you've been, you stepped away from it. Or you need to know him for the very first time and I want to pray with you. The Bible says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that, that you believe that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. But you have to believe in your heart and then you have to confess him as Lord. And I'll help you do that through a prayer. If that's you this morning and you want to come close to God, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life or you want to come back to him, would you raise your hand up right now in this place? Yes, I see that hand. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, is there anybody else? Come on now, come on, yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It begins with a decision. We'll confess him out of our mouth, but then you follow it up. I'm going to say it this way. By every day managing that decision with Christ and choosing the 
words and the actions filtered by the word and his spirit. So if that's you, you raise your hand. Put your hand on your heart with me right now. And let's pray this prayer. Let's pray it boldly. Dear Heavenly Father, I do believe in you. And I believe in your son, Jesus. Today, I lay my sins at the feet of Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I give my life to you. I believe you raised Jesus from the dead so I could live. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your love. And give me a desire for everything of you. My life is no longer mine, but it's yours. And today I choose to walk in the blessing. Today I choose to walk in love. Today I choose life. In the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, give, give, give the Lord some praise. Now, Pastor Nietzsche is going to explain some things to you, but we have a, a wonderful system to help you. If you made that decision this morning, there's a card you were giving, given when you came in today. You fill that card out. Put it in the offering bucket. If this is the first time here, you just put that card in the offering bucket, okay? It'll go by at the, at the end of service here. And we're going to follow up, and we're going to get you a book that will help you. It's called Next Step. What's next? And we're going to help you in this walk with Christ. We need you at the church, and the church needs you. Amen. And we're going to help you find your life in Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. Gosh, amen. You. And if you did not get a Connect card when you came, hospitality area so be sure that you give us your information those of you that raised your hand because when you raise your hand that's a personal commitment that you're saying Lord I want that but then your next step is to fill out that card so we can get you that book and that letter and just connect with you I promise we won't bother you we're just going to give you the information so you know what your next step is and we can help you know God more Amen. And then we put that connect card in the offering bucket as it goes by here in a few moments. But right now we are going to prepare our hearts to give. Last week I did mention to you that we are helping the victims that got hit by Hurricane Helene. And I just kind of wanted to share with you because if those of you who don't know Convoy of Hope, that's who we partner with, I just want you to kind of hear and know what your weekly giving to the church is doing. Not only is it helping us here at, in Des Moines and with our church, but every month we're giving into other ministries. And right now I got this report from Convoy of Hope. In one town alone, not only are they bringing relief aid, water, food, construction supplies, and teams of people to help clear up the devastation, but during all of this, they're sharing Jesus Christ. And in one town alone in Perry, Florida, they served over 2,500 people, and they were able to pray with over 150 individuals. I mean, could you imagine how busy we get in a day? And then by the end of the day, do you ever think, oh, I didn't even share Jesus with anybody. I didn't even ask anybody if I could pray with them. But these people are here in wreckage, and they're still praying with people and leading them to Jesus. They have five salvations in Perry, Florida. That's just one town. They're doing this, yeah, give the Lord a hand clap of praise that we could be a part of this. They're doing this in Asheville, North Carolina. They're all across Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. There's multiple truckloads that are still going out to help these victims. And on, this report came out October 2nd, we got from them, that by October 2nd. So now the number's higher, because today's October 6th. But at that point, they had already distributed 615,000 pounds of product, and they had already served over 35,000 people. Wow. And we all had a part of that. Amen. 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 Yeah. I just want you to share with you, our vision isn't to recreate the wheel. Our vision is to pour gas where there's already fire. 
And we, we don't have the abilities to be in Florida and Alabama and North Carolina, South Carolina, but they do. And so part of our monthly giving goes there. And this week we're sending an extra seed there as well to help with this uh, tragedy and the hurricane. Because as you've heard, I've heard the government isn't doing a very good job on it. And so uh, it takes the church and it should be the church that steps out in a time of need. Can, I, can you get in, men? We do that here in Des Moines, too, with Garden Gate Ranch, people who have been sex trafficked. We do it with Ruth Harbor, who take care of single women who are pregnant. We do that with Joppa and the homeless. We do that with Dads with a Purpose right here on campus for sober living. That's where your giving is going. Part of your giving is going for that. And we pour gas on that fire so they can do what they've been called to do. We want to thank you for your generosity. Father, we 